I'm Bill Marion and an electric red bug on Jekyll Island and this is a nose for life. So the family enjoyed a trip to the beach for an early summer getaway. This quick spur of the moment vacation was actually my mom's idea, which means her grandkids, that is to say my kids, are probably behind the whole thing. Seriously, the most obvious conspiracy in this video is how my kids conspire to get my mom to do their bidding. You gotta love grandparents. But when my mom's in charge of getaways, there are three things you can count on. A nice condo with an amazing view, the best seafood places in the world that you can't find on the internet, and the destination, which is always Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island is less than seven hours from my house, give or take, depending on traffic. We usually leave for a vacation as early as possible so we don't waste a day, which means I get to rock out listening to Susan Tedeschi or one of my other favorites. And I also get to enjoy some pretty amazing sunrises. Just off the coast of Georgia is a beautiful historical island that's very popular for tourists looking for a peaceful getaway on the beach. Jekyll Island is a small island with about 8 miles of flat beaches, but most of Jekyll is beautiful tidal marshlands. Jekyll Island is one of the Golden Isles of Georgia that includes St. Simons Island, Sea Island, Little St. Simons Island, Historic Brunswick, and of course Jekyll Island. This island resort town is different than Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, Panama City, Daytona, or Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Jekyll Island is a charming island where Spanish moss hangs from the trees Trees, making it feel old and historic and perhaps mysterious even if you don't know the topic of this video. It's vibrant with wildlife, walking trails, great beaches with gentle or no waves at all. It's definitely not a surfing town, but it's excellent for kayaking, fishing, and other outdoor sports. Well, on my last video, we did about the U.S. Rocket and Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and I jokingly talked about how hot it is in Alabama. What's so cool about Jekyll is that even in the summertime, and it's not quite summer yet, yes, it, got, it does get hot. You're in the deep south here, so it gets very hot. But you have that ocean breeze coming off. You're on an island, and so it's like an oasis as far as the southern heat's concerned. Cool mornings, very cool mornings. There are great activities for the kids too, like a water park in Georgia Sea Turtle Center. The condos are a little above average, and the food around or on the island is great too, but there's something about Jekyll Island that's just different, and in a good way. My family's been coming here for the past 15, 20 years. It's not an every year vacation spot for my wife Carolyn or myself, but it is for my parents, and somehow my kids manage to find a way into their suitcases. My parents go to Jekyll Island almost every year, and one would think that my teenagers would want to go somewhere else, maybe to another beach where the teenagers outnumber the sand, but that's what makes Jekyll Island so different. My kids love being here with their grandparents. They don't think it's boring, and they don't complain or demand someplace else that might seem more exciting. And I've talked to other people who frequent Jekyll Island who say the exact same thing. Jekyll Island is very unique, but it's not my favorite beach, seriously, and that's nothing personal to the people and businesses of Jekyll Island. I always have an amazing time when I'm there, don't get me wrong. In fact, it's nice that it's quiet and that our family spends more quality time together when we're there. But we all have our favorite beach towns or islands, and mine's Cocoa Beach in Florida. It's the whole Space Coast thing with Cape Canaveral being right there across the way, and it's the surfing capital of the East Coast, and I love to surf that one time. It's pretty awesome. My kids love Cocoa Beach too, but this year, Carol and I have been through quite a bit, and we thought it was a good idea to take mom up on our invitation to visit the island. I began creating video content for the internet about a year ago, and soon I'm going to talk about my first year of making YouTube videos, but for now, let me just say that if you're really trying to make YouTube videos and giving it all you got, or at least as much as you can or know how to give, and especially if your channel is about living and experiencing life that's all around you, then you're always looking for ways to turn anything into video content. So when mom invited us to the condo at Jekyll, it was a no-brainer for three reasons. First, my family needed some quality time to focus and do some planning for the near future. Second, my wife Carolyn really needed some additional time off. And Jekyll Island happens to be a great place to shoot a YouTube video. Do you have any idea how many videos are floating around the internet about a real, honest-to-goodness secret meeting that took place here on Jekyll Island? A lot. Carol and I haven't been to Jekyll Island since I've been making YouTube videos, so I couldn't wait. And I'll tell you now, of all the videos I've seen about the creation of the Federal Reserve, none that I know of actually go on location to Jekyll Island, and we're taking you with us. This video is called the Jekyll Island Conspiracy, and the word conspiracy these days can mean different things to different people. For many people, when you attach the word conspiracy, it usually isn't true, and even if it is, there's no way to prove it. You may or may not believe in UFOs or Bigfoot, but the word conspiracy is often attached to opinions incorrectly. Officially, the term conspiracy theory is now a negative term, and technically, if you're the kind of person that doesn't believe things happen by accident 100% of the time, and that people don't get together behind closed doors and create ideas to influence public opinion or maximize
maximize profits? Well, you're a conspiracy theorist. If you want to hear more about the circle of people that are being included into this category, I provided links in the description. You may need a tinfoil hat and just not realize it yet. But I want to be clear, this video is accurate historically. The conspiracy in this video might be considered a political conspiracy and quite possibly a civil conspiracy, but it's not a conspiracy theory. This really happened. It's factual history simply left out of your history book. But first, if you're a subscriber to A Nose for Life, I just want to say thank you so much for coming back and watching our content again and again. Please don't forget to hit that like button and please share on all of your social media platforms so that we can grow this channel. We make these videos just for you. If you watch our videos but you're not a subscriber, I want to encourage you to make sure that you have subscribed. Make sure that you've highlighted and click the subscribe button and also click the little bell for notifications. That way you know when we've released a new video and we promise not to annoy you too much when it comes to constant bombardments of notifications. Normally, as of right now, we make anywhere between one to three videos a week for YouTube and for Vidme, and so we really hope that you will subscribe to our channel and follow our channel. If this is your first time visiting the Nose for Life, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We really hope you like our content. We're kind of cheesy. That's just who we are. We hope that you want to be a part of a cheesy hokey channel that's just a little different. A group of men conspired successfully to change the monetary system of the United States and they used deceitful tactics to do so. Furthermore, these men positioned themselves to lead a new system of banking that granted this new entity extraordinary unchecked power outside of government control. That means this entity is not subject to the will of the voting public. The information presented in this video is even commemorated in a beautiful century-old hotel on Jekyll Island. But honestly, these facts are pretty easy to find. And yet, statistically, this will be the first time you've heard this information. On Jekyll Island, my mom's favorite island beach destination, the entire modern U.S. banking system was birthed just over a hundred years ago by a group of very wealthy men in secret. Yes, here, below the gorgeous Spanish moss that hangs from the trees, the Federal Reserve was born. You may know this piece of history, and if you do, I ask that you watch this video anyway and make sure I get the facts right. And you're more than welcome to provide your thoughts, opinions, and questions in the comment section, and I may use your comments or questions in an upcoming video. I want to be completely honest and open and transparent about this video. I'm not a banker, and I'm not an economist. I studied history, education, and theology in college so I can read, and that's how I've learned this information. On YouTube, Vidme, and other video platforms, I've seen over 20 videos that discuss the creation of the Federal Reserve. Most of these videos are well made and very entertaining, but these videos have a tendency to draw conclusions using information mixed with conjecture. And in other words, they put pieces of a puzzle together that may indeed fit, but there's not enough evidence, at least not for me, that some of these videos are correct in their ultimate conclusions. Again, I don't necessarily agree with everything these amazing creators have to say about the creation of the Federal Reserve, but they're still serious content creators with an enormous amount of knowledge on the topic, so it's worth your time to check out some of the links I have in the description. My personal fascination with the events I'm going to share is first, why was I taught this in college? Or why didn't my parents know about this when I was a kid? And why don't more people address it in the mainstream and just get it out there to the general public? Truthfully, I think I know the answer to those questions, but my answers are really just my opinion, not facts. And I'm not going too deep into my personal opinions in this video. Second, how is it that some of the most historically significant events take place in the oddest places? Or how is it that this lovely island off the coast of Georgia hosted the biggest financial game changer in history? A few days ago, the Federal Reserve announced that interest rates will be increasing, which means it will cost you more money to borrow money. But it also means a lot more to the economy. We all remember the financial crisis that destroyed the economy for a while, and since then, well, everyone stays a little uneasy when it comes to the economy. For a few years, it seemed like nothing was going right. Gas prices were insane, and people all over the U.S. and even the world were losing their jobs, their personal savings, and their purchasing power. The middle class, once considered the most important aspect of an industrialized society, isn't just shrinking it's disappearing. Most people agree that things are improving gradually, but I don't run into too many people who think everything is back to, quote, normal. In fact, many people are talking about a new normal. And though I don't have time to really get into what that actually means in this video, the simplest way to explain it is that people have to work harder to earn less money. When I hear that the U.S. economy is going to be just fine, I'm pretty suspicious, but I admit I have no evidence one way or the other. I do want to ask, better for who? I can say this video is not a gloom and doom video. 
What I do know is that when the Federal Reserve talks, everyone listens. But where did the Federal Reserve get its power? There are some things you have to know before we can move forward. You need a simple and brief factual understanding of the political and economic atmosphere in the early days of the 20th century to understand why this conspiracy was successful and to understand why some people think the creation of the Federal Reserve is a good thing or the most evil thing that's ever happened in U.S. history. But remember, history doesn't happen in a vacuum. The Federal Reserve wasn't created because of a series of isolated events. History simply doesn't work that way. But we're going to focus strictly on the 20th century and a few events that led to the secret meeting on Jekyll Island that changed U.S. banking forever, for better or worse, depending on who you ask. First, and this may shock you, the Federal Reserve is not associated in any form or fashion with the government of the United States. That's right, it doesn't belong to any branch of government. When we hear the word federal, we assume its meaning is connected to the term federation, which is a form of government in which there is a division of powers between two levels of government of equal status. So we further assume that the Federal Reserve is a part of the U.S. government. We use slang like, quote, the feds to describe government law enforcement, and rightfully so. Law enforcement is a part of the federal government. The Federal Reserve is not. Not to jump ahead, but this is the most obvious part of the historical conspiracy. The entity that was created on Jekyll Island was named the Federal Reserve to intentionally mislead the public. And it worked, and for most Americans, it's still working today. So if the Federal Reserve is not a part of the U.S. government, what is it, why was it created, and what's with all the secrecy? Especially if the information is meant to be a little confusing or worded in such a way that it's intended for you to assume one thing, but it means something else. But I'm going to make this real easy to understand, first by telling you about the secret meeting on Jekyll Island, especially who all was involved and the purpose of the meeting. Second, by explaining in the simplest terms how the Federal Reserve works. In the description, you'll find links to the Federal Reserve that will go into a lot more detail. So, let's begin with the secret meeting. Let me be clear. That six men met on Jekyll Island to come up with a plan that would benefit themselves is not a conspiracy. Don't get me wrong. It's mysterious that they traveled in separate trains at night with the shades pulled down so no one in the press would know that these particular men were meeting in secret. And it's funny that when the local press at Jekyll Island did identify the men and started asking questions, the official cover story was that they were on Jekyll Island together for a duck hunt. But people meet in secret all the time to make plans that affect society. Honestly, the separate trains traveling at night, which I do all the time, I might add, and claiming that it's all about a duck hunt, well, that just makes the event colorful. Unless, unless you know the economic and political climate during that time period. The reality is that had anyone known about this meeting, it would have been seen as a conspiracy and an undermining of the will of the public. Public knowledge of this meeting may have caused riots or worse. Five of these six men were a pretty big deal, but as we'll discuss in a few moments, the public did not want the same things these men wanted. That's why they had to meet in secret. In fact, no one knew about this meeting until 30 years after the fact. So we begin with the leader of this meeting, Senator Nelson Aldrich. Senator Nelson Aldrich, a veteran of the American Civil War, began his political career in 1869, and by 1881 he was serving in the U.S. Senate, eventually becoming the most powerful senator of his time. Aldrich was a financial expert, and he chaired the Finance Committee and pushed legislation through that was supposed to make the U.S. economy a little more flexible. Despite his ability, the plan wasn't really working. In fact, nothing was working. See, banks all over the U.S. were privately owned and regulated by each individual state. Currencies varied, and exchanges between states were unstable and risky. Runs on local banks were normal occurrences. Simply stated, banks are supposed to be a safe place for you to keep your money, but banks make money on lending money to other people and charging interest. Often, banks lent more money than they could cover, and it's very profitable to do so. A bank run happens for different reasons, though. Sometimes, a simple rumor could start a bank run. Regardless, at the turn of the century, banks began filing bankruptcy increasingly, and by 1907, it reached epidemic proportions. The panic of 1907 isn't talked about a lot today because of the Great Depression that came almost 30 years later that was much worse. But the panic of 1907 was unimaginable as well. New York trust companies, unlike nationally chartered banks, didn't require collateral for loans. So trust companies were able to issue overnight loans to stockbrokers to purchase securities. It may sound crazy, but when the market was stable, it worked for everyone. Trust companies kept, kept the stock market rolling with cash to invest. The problem is that New York trust didn't have as much money in the vault, so to speak, as chartered banks. So New York trust money kept the market rolling. Rolling. Runs of the bank caused the public to begin withdrawing money from trust at record numbers during the Panic of 1907. So money to feed the stock market dried up. And worse, some of the largest and most trusted banks in New York began closing their doors. Remember, banks do more than just lend money to build or produce something someone wants. Industry builds and expands for future potential products, and as a consequence, people are able to keep working and making money, and that money makes its way to the Main Street. 
meaning the average person is able to make money and then put it back into the bank. It's a big circle. Industry borrows money from the banks to produce something that may be sold at a profit. If the bank has to charge too much interest, industry is restricted because interest cuts into profitability. The years following the 1907 panic, industrial output fell by 17% and the GNP by 12%. On a side note, the financial crisis of 2008 has more in common with the panic of 1907 than the Great Depression. The financial crisis of 2008 affected me negatively in several ways, and I believe it's still affecting us now. If you want to know more about the unique relationship between the financial crisis of 2008 and the panic of 1907, well, there's a link in the description. The connection is strange, considering that most Americans believe falsely that the Federal Reserve is supposed to fix all of that. Where did we ever get such an idea? Well, that's for later. In any case, the public was disgusted with trust companies and banks alike risking their life savings on the stock market. The word of the day coming from the working public and industrialists alike was reform. In response to the public's demand for reform, in 1908, Senator Nelson Aldrich passed the Aldrich Freeland Act. But the public really wasn't satisfied because the act didn't have any teeth, so the market continued to struggle, slowing down production. The Aldrich Freeland Act wasn't enough to restore confidence in the market. And even from the government's perspective, things were getting weird in Europe quickly, as already at this point, war drums were being heard across the continent for varying reasons, even though the world was still six years away from fighting the war to end all wars. But nationalistic ambition and international trade cost money, and by this point, industrial leaders knew that continuing profitability meant global expansion. And expansion isn't possible without a powerful military protecting national interest. Now, you pay for a military by taxation, but mobilization of that army usually takes borrowed money. This is all the more reason Americans didn't want a centralized banking system that could produce or take money out of the market and rush into a European war. Remember, Remember, Americans were isolationists at the time, and they had been since its creation. There were as many if not more protests regarding World War I than the Vietnam War. Americans from every class of society feared centralized banking, though their reasons varied widely. Andrew Jackson shut down the previous central bank, and since the days of Jackson, the economy fluctuated, but inflation remained flat, which is a good thing when it comes to wages and purchasing power. The public at large hated the idea of an institution that printed money at the government's behest, believing that such an institution would only make matters worse. By all accounts, for the average citizen, creating a banking system wasn't even a part of the discussion. People were begging for reform. The problem is that reform meant different things to different people. There was no unifying voice of reform, just people screaming for reform. And no one knew public opinion better than Aldrich. But Aldrich was determined to get the U.S. economy back up and running. He studied, and he studied some more. And when that didn't work, he traveled to Europe to study European finance. This will be important later. Aldrich was willing to do anything to get the wheels of industry up and running full steam, which is why he found himself running full steam on a train to check Island. And I guess that's what's so funny, is that there was a great amount of effort to keep that meeting a secret. To keep that meeting a secret, not just for a decade or two, but even to this day here at Jekyll Island, you have to Google the fact that the Federal Reserve was hatched up here to, to find any information about it, because you won't find a lot of information here. We're even going to check the hotel itself where the meeting allegedly took place. You know, when I was in college, I think I took 12 hours in journalism. There was five minutes in my college career that I was going to be a journalist, five minutes, which lasted about a semester. I think I attended about five minutes worth of those classes too, but that's not the point. I would make a horrible journalist, much too blunt, too forward, don't really know how to get the good answers out of people. I mean, seriously, the only way that I know how to ask people about the alleged, can't say alleged, the meeting that took place here at Jekyll Island is to literally walk in the lobby doors and ask and kind of be forced to accept whatever answer I get. So that's what we're going to do. I call it bullheaded or bald-headed journalism. Hey, sir. So I'm wrong. Here in the hotel, they do commemorate the creation of the Federal Reserve right here in uh, just off the hotel lobby in a nice, beautiful breakfast room. In fact, behind me is a beautiful picture of the men who uh, created the Federal Reserve. Originally, I was going to cover each person who attended the meeting in detail. In fact, I even completed the voiceovers for that kind of a video, but it's long, and I think I have a better way to tell you about the men who met on Jekyll Island. First, the men who met in secret and under the cover of darkness referred to themselves as the First Name Club because they only used their first names on the trip. At least, that's one of the versions of the story. I've already told you about Senator Nelson Aldrich, who was the leader of the meeting, but I also have to add that this list of people who met on the island, well, it varies. There's good reason to believe that a lot more than just six people met on Jekyll, like Benjamin Strong. After all, a few of the other attendees 
Louise and countless of other people who have gone on the record stating that a lot more influential people were actually at the meeting. For this video, we might as well stick with the official story that you can access in the links I've included in the description, particularly about the Federal Reserve. Officially, it's J.P. Morgan that organized the meeting. That's why the meeting was held on Jekyll Island at the Jekyll Island Club. Morgan was a distinguished member of the club and made all of the lodging and security arrangements. Besides, most if not all the members of the Jekyll Island Club were a part of the same financial circle or network. In addition to Senator Nelson Aldrich, the following people were also at the secret meeting. Piot Andrew, Henry Davidson, Arthur Sheldon, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Warburg were invited and attended the meeting. All of these men were in the who's who of the banking industry, and let me be clear, if the public knew that these particular men were meeting at all, it would have affected the entire financial system. Let me explain it as it is. These men and their partners and associates wanted to move America in a certain direction, but the average citizen didn't want anything to do with it. Maybe we can debate that in the comments below, but for now, here are some interesting facts that will be very important. First, just weeks or months prior to the secret meeting, three of the six men who were officially at the meeting traveled to Europe to study the European banking system, and one of the six men had previously earned a PhD in finance while studying abroad in Europe. And Paul Warburg, originally from Germany and at the time not a citizen of the U.S., was a European banking expert. Warburg became a citizen of the U.S. a year after the meeting. All of the men at the meeting wanted to expand U.S. international trade. Three of the men were connected to J.P. Morgan, but that's almost silly to mention because because everyone was connected to J.P. Morgan. Remember the Panic of 1907 or the Knickerbocker Crisis? Well, many believe that J.P. Morgan was behind the whole thing by spreading rumors that caused the runs on the banks and the trust. Now, that's just speculation. Here's what the men were trying to work out during their nine days on Jekyll Island. And according to all accounts, these men worked day and night on their plan. First, the men wanted to end recessions that seemed to occur every 15 years by changing the banking system in such a way that it was more flexible. This might be possible if the central bank was able to increase increase and decrease interest rates and control the amount of currency in the market. Currency at the time was backed by gold, so banking institutions were limited as to how much they could lend. But farmers were worried about Wall Street taking over everything if this happened. So instead of the central bank, they came up with the idea of a network of banks, sort of an internal systems of checks and balances. A chain of command for banks, meaning that a small bank could approach a regional bank for loans to issue. A board of directors would determine the interest rates for the country and govern the banks. The government, the U.S. government, or the voting public would have representation on the board of directors. Second, the men wanted to devise a way to develop better international trade. At the time, American banks couldn't operate overseas. This made it to where money exchanges were through London, which isn't advantageous for American businessmen. Money exchanges from one state to the next here in the U.S. was difficult as well. The men wanted to end varying U.S. currencies and create one currency for the U.S. <laughs> We know that this story that took place here at Jekyll Island, we know that it happened. We know that it's true. We know that the men met in secrecy. And here's how. News about the secret meeting began leaking as early as 1916. But everyone involved denied the meeting and continued denying it for 20 years. Senator Nelson Aldrich was the first to spill the beans in an autobiography released in 1930, but Aldrich's admission comes after other people began taking credit for the creation of the Federal Reserve. After Aldrich, everyone began spilling the beans, but the information was diluted quite simply because other people were also taking credit for the Federal Reserve as well. So that by 1930, the who and where the Federal Reserve was hashed out wasn't really an issue because, well, most people have a short-term memory. Still, is this a conspiracy? Well, I'm not sure how anyone can walk away from this story and not see it as a conspiracy whether you support the Federal Reserve or not. But let's just add a few more interesting facts about the passing of the Federal Reserve Act and then you can tell me what you think in the comments. For starters, it didn't pass its first go around Congress. It had to be tweaked a little and rebranded, so thus the new name, the Federal Reserve Act. Bingo. It's all about rebranding. But renaming something so it doesn't sound like it's being ran by a bunch of bankers didn't seal the deal. There were many compromises that were made over a three-year time period, with only a handful of Congress knowing who came up with the plan and when and where, other than Senator Aldrich. So for a while, people just assumed that the Federal Reserve Act was just another form of the, the aldrich Vreeland plan, but with better teeth. And on what day did Congress vote on the Federal Reserve Act? Tw December 22, 1913. And it was signed the next day by President Woodrow Wilson on December 20. The general public was virtually clueless as to the power that was handed to the Federal Reserve. And honestly, most people to this day have no idea what the Federal Reserve does. So did the Federal Reserve end recessions? Well, no, not by a long shot. But the Federal Reserve argues that though it cannot prevent recessions, it's been empowered with tools to assist. Also, the IRS was created 
shortly after the Federal Reserve, and within a year of its creation, we were in the middle of World War I, a European war that was so terrible it earned itself a secret. If you don't know anything about the Federal Reserve, I really do recommend you watching some of the other videos in the description. So what do I think about the Federal Reserve? Well, I mean, it works to an extent. I mean, in some ways, inflation is worse now since we've had a Federal Reserve than at any point in our history uh, here in America or the world's history for that matter. But that's not entirely the Federal Reserve's fault. I mean, people forget, especially die-hard conspiracy theorists, you know, I mean, the, the ones that believe in the Illuminati and that the Federal Reserve is a part of this grand scheme to enslave all of humanity. The problem with that is that it doesn't account for a few things. The conspiracy, that is. The fact that we have fought some of the biggest wars in history, well, the biggest wars in history in the 20th century, which also contributes to inflation for various reasons. And we've had a Cold War, which was the, the biggest military buildup in history, biggest technological militaristic buildup in history, also took place during that time period in which the U.S. government uh, got deeper and deeper in debt and still getting deeper in debt because of the military industrial complex. So you can't put all of that on the Federal Reserve. You have to put that on policymakers. The Federal Reserve just made it possible. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't discredit all the conspiracy theorists when it comes to the Federal Reserve. You can't. Because in some ways, the meeting here at Jekyll Island is sort of a mafia-like meeting. I mean, not mafia in the sense of The Godfather and all those awesome mafia movies that uh, that we love, right? For whatever crazy reason we love them, but we do. Let's just face it, we can quote most of them. But no, it is a cartel, a banking cartel that met here that in some ways manipulated the American people as well as Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson wasn't necessarily for uh, for banking. He was for a, for a Federal Reserve type of style banking. He was for reform which is what the people that met here use, the strategy that they use in order to convince people that their plan for the banking system here in America was a good plan because it was all about reform, when in actuality it was really all about control and organization, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Behind me is the legendary Ben, a picture of the legendary Ben Bernanke, as well as Alan Greenspan commemorating the 100 years of the Federal Reserve. You know, considering all of the YouTube conspiracy theories I've seen about the Federal Reserve, and some of them are the best, most well-made YouTube videos that are out there. And seriously, I enjoy watching them. They're, they're put together well, very documentary style, very intense. I fully expected that when I pulled out my phone in the hotel, uh, that sure enough, security would come out and throw me to the floor and frisk me, thinking I'm giving up some kind of crazy secret of some kind. But the truth is, is that the staff here, they are absolutely amazing. I want to thank uh, David Chappell for showing us around, showing us into the rooms with the pictures. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that you're not going to find plaques around the island about the Federal Reserve being created. You're not going to find a whole lot of, of uh, detailed history, historical accounts. It, it was a secret meeting. That, there's no doubt about that. But they're not really a secret now. Um, in fact, like I, you saw the pictures. Um, there's plenty of pictures inside that commemorate the event and the Federal Reserve to this day. But the staff here, they don't think a whole lot about it. And I even asked a couple of the staff, they didn't want to be on camera, if there's a lot of people who, you know, come and ask about the Federal Reserve and meeting here in secret, and they all say, no. When you come to Jekyll Island, uh, you'll notice that the lawn is extremely manicured, like the entire grounds. They're just absolutely beautiful and natural. The problem with that is when you're filming a YouTube, when they're doing their work, it's kind of noisy because there's weed eaters going and they're working on the ground. So when you pull up here at Jekyll Island to this beautiful historic house and this whole historic district here in, in, at Jekyll, expect to be bewildered by its beauty. It's gorgeous. Now, a few weeks ago, we did a video about the Biltmore, and then I followed that up with a video about gargoyles. You can see the video about the Biltmore and the shadow-esque uh, architectural style that was used during that time period right here. But here's the thing. I expected to see that style here at Jekyll because these homes were built around the same time period. So I was expecting to see the same attributes uh, architecturally here that I saw at the Biltmore. And I almost walked away thinking that that wasn't the case until I found this. You no, know, seriously, it's not like I have a thing for gargoyles or anything, I don't. They kind of creep me out, but it, it's the shadow-esque architectural style that I really find amazing, uh, beautiful in so many different ways. And yes, uh, you know, the house here at Jekyll, I call it the Federal Reserve Conspiracy House, but the house here is in the shadow-esque style. 
uh, but you don't see the gargoyles, at least I don't see any around that house, but you do here at the chapel. Gargoyles or no gargoyles, this is a cozy little church and I could definitely worship in here. It's cozy. It looks like something out of the 19th century because it is. Have I mentioned the landscaping here yet? Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. They even have guided tours here uh, as far as the landscaping around the grounds and I, I would take that tour, that's amazing. I think Carol and I have already decided that it, when we come back to Jekyll, because Jekyll is one of our family's places to visit or whatever, I, we're definitely gonna take a landscaping tour because it's just, we just keep finding amazing flowers, beautiful, beautiful scenery. Some of the conspiracy theorists will talk about how the, fe the history of the Federal Reserve is sort of hidden in plain sight. I would have to say that I agree with that part. It is hidden in plain sight. It's available, the information is available, but I did have to go into the beautiful hotel. I did have to ask, I mean, again, I said this earlier, but I was treated marvelously. My wife was treated marvelously. They were wonderful, full of information, very respectful, uh, and I wanna stay at that hotel. Oh my gosh, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, but it is something where you have to engage. You know, if I was the Federal Reserve, here's what I would do, totally honest with you. You know, just come out of the closet about it. Make it like a Federal Reserve theme park. Like you could have roller coasters, like Federal Reserve roller coasters where, you know, we call it the stock market crash roller coaster, you know, where things go real, real high and then, and then they drop. Maybe you call that the bubble. So if you believe in the Federal Reserve Illuminati conspiracy, that the whole world is turning into a global octopus monster, well, some of your supporting evidence could be here with this phone. The first transcontinental telephone call was made here on Jekyll Island in 1915, connecting the world by telephone. They were already trying to connect us to the web of lies and conspiracy then. <laughs> it's hard for me to buy into the whole grand conspiracy thing that a group of men that met a hundred years ago, uh, influenced by a, some type of Illuminati, you know, control everything and have been controlling everything since the beginning. Because correlation is not the same as causation. Yes, it's true that we are definitely headed towards a globalistic society, but the reality of it is that technology would have pushed us that direction anyway. Many, many people have envisioned a global society for hundreds of years. So here at Jekyll Island, like many resort vacation kind of places you can rent these electric cars and they're pretty cool they only go about 25 miles an hour so it's kind of like Fred Flintstone driving if you're old enough to remember Fred Flintstone you kind of got to kick your feet out to the side and push them just a little bit but Carol and I are enjoying driving around the island if our battery holds up long enough hey but if you've watched the Opryland video you'll remember that at Opry Mills they have a charging station but unlike Opry Mills you don't have to pay for the charging stations here so when your battery runs low on your rented electric little scooter car thingy that you have rented you can plug it in and there's a charging stations from what I understand all over the island and they're free of course it does cost six dollars to drive on the island and that pass is good for 24 hours sometimes you get a bonus day, I think, of an additional 24 hours. For the week, it's uh, $24, $24 for the week, I believe. Uh, anyway, you can check the, the Jekyll Island website out for that, but it does cost to come on the island. Uh, so if you uh, book a room or whatever the case is, it's something to think about. It's just six bucks, but uh, you can come on the island and enjoy it for a day if you're staying in the area. So it's true, since the Federal Reserve has been around, we've had a lot of recessions. We've had the Great Depression and some of the biggest wars in history. But pointing your finger at the Federal Reserve to say that it's actually their fault, or that they're a part of some type of global conspiracy making it all happen, that's a pretty big stretch. And it would involve too many people. Besides, it's not been all bad since the Fed's been around. I mean, think about it. I'm in an electric car right now on Jekyll Island. An electrical car, that's really cool. In fact, after the formation of the Federal Reserve, we're powering up everything. Phone lines are going up everywhere. Eventually, everybody's got cars, and we've got all kinds of cool stuff. We can go into space. I mean, really, the Federal Reserve did a whole lot of good, a great deal of good at stabilizing the market across America and eventually helping out the entire world. I would love to sing the song Somewhere Beyond the Sea right now, but unfortunately, international copyright laws won't allow it. And plus, you probably wouldn't want to hear me sing that song. But it's a great song. A special thank you to Dennis and Violet Johnson, AKA grandparents, for an amazing weekend here at Jekyll Island. They made this video possible. Also want to thank Anna, Nathan, and Crystal, and of course, Carolyn, my wife, for making this trip amazing. This video would not be possible without all of them making it possible. I also want to thank Ken Hartley, who helped make this weekend possible as well. He's a special friend to a Nose for Life on this channel. 
thank you, the visitor, subscriber, follower on Vidme, whatever the case is, thank you for watching this video. And hey, there are some additional videos that you can see at the end of this video just by clicking on the little square with the little picture in it. Seafood and you're in the Jekyll Island area. One of the best places, and everybody knows about it, is called Gin Rights. It's called Gin Rights, and it's a, it's a great place to eat. Check them out. Tell Bill sent you from Tennessee. We love